So Rabbi Nathan Alfred became the first resident rabbi for the United Hebrew Congregation Singapore. It's an egalitarian, inclusive, progressive, reform Jewish community in, Jan in, in January 2015. Rabbi Nathan was ordained by Leo Bake College in 2008 and since then has worked to build up two liberal communities in Belgium and Luxembourg with much success. British-born Rabbi Nathan grew up in a reform community in southeast London. He read classics at King's College, Cambridge, before spending some time in Hungary playing chess, his major passion, which was in Budapest. I would now like to request Rabbi to come and take the stage and uh, tell us a bit about what Judaism teaches about interfaith relations and national harmony. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have to admit that when I uh, saw the program for this afternoon, I was a little bit worried to have the slot after the afternoon tea. <laughs> <laughs> because this traditionally is the time when all of you, you know, you've eaten something and you drank something, a little cake, a little coffee, a spring roll, and now you really want to, to kind of doze off and, and go into a, into a sleep. Um, and I just want to tell you that's okay. That's okay. Um, we say in Judaism, I'm sure you have in other religions as well, in Kemach, in Torah. If there's no food, there can be no Torah, there can be no study. Um, that food is essential to, to, to Torah study, to, to uh, intellectual uh, capability as well. And I always claim that my, uh, my intelligence is in my stomach, but uh, you know, probably I would. <coughs> I must also uh, say that there's a Yiddish proverb uh, that if you, that uh, if you, uh, ein, ein bagel in ein cholem is keine bagel in keine cholem. Um, a bagel in a dream is neither a bagel nor a dream. <laughs> so it's probably better that you've enjoyed that food and, and can, can, can digest it rather than you're thinking about food um, and that you're, you have something somewhere else to get to. So that, 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 just to begin with some, some food jokes to <laughs> keep you awake. <laughs> I should also mention my thanks uh, to be here with you this afternoon um, in, this, in this mosque, in this, um, t together in this, in this interfaith uh, um, setup. And I have to say that uh, since I last saw Ayaz a few weeks ago, had some wonderful news um, that I am now engaged to my, uh, mm. my fiancé. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we're going to get married in, in the summer uh, in, in, in Haifa, uh, in Israel, close to, uh, to where, where she grew up, in the Carmel Forest. Um, so some very happy news. Um, <laughs> but I also need to say that uh, my, my fiancé's mother, so my future mother-in-law uh, lives in, uh, in the district of Haifa called Kebabia, um, next to the uh, Ahmadiyya uh, mosque that's in, uh, in Kebabia. Mm -hmm. So it's a great pleasure to, to, be, to be here today. Um, I don't know how well mother-in-law jokes uh, translate across religions. <laughs> <laughs> and I also, I mean, because it's a little bit sexist, a little bit misogynist, a little bit inter, inter, intergenerationally ageist, and I'm not even married to, to the girl yet, so I don't even have a, have a mother-in-law. So I need to, to say this you know, a little bit lightly, um, but my future mother-in-law says that the, the Ahmadiyya and Kababir are wonderful people. Um, and I think if that's a compliment who can kind of get on well with my future mother-in-law, then it must be a real, real compliment. So that's as far as I'm gonna, gonna go with that. I notice, um, in this, uh, this, this flyer that you, that you have, this, this leaflet, which contains the different messages from the different faiths, that there are two Jewish quotes. And one of them says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Um, it's, from, it's from the book of Psalms uh, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and it's something that we sing, we, we tell the kids, we, you know, we, we sing this song at almost every opportunity. Isn't it wonderful and pleasant when brothers and sisters sit together? 
And you have to ask myself, why do we tell this to each other so often? And as I was sitting here this afternoon listening to the other speakers, it's amazing, you know, the truths of the different religions are so close to each other, I find myself agreeing, oh yeah, I know this from, from, from us, I know this. Oh, this is a good way of putting it, why don't, we, why don't we try putting it like that as well? There's so much wisdom in all the religions. And then I ask myself the question, well, you know, if, if we really all, all the religions believe this love for all, hatred for none, then why are there so many disagreements in the world? Right? When religious leaders can come together, can, can talk, can share, can understand that there's one God with, with many aspects and many ways of, of, of getting there, um, why, do we, why do we argue so much you know, with, with each other, within our own religions as well, um, and even within our own families? And this verse in the, in the Torah, in the Psalms, how good and how beautiful it is when brothers and sisters dwell together, comes against the backdrop in the Hebrew Bible, against the book of Genesis, which shows just how dysfunctional our families can be. Now, I don't know about your families. I obviously can't talk beyond, beyond my own. Um, but you know, in a Jewish family, uh, dysfunctional is kind of a, a way of life. Um, you know, we see it from the Bible itself. Uh, we see it with the first family, Adam and Eve. Cain and Abel, you know, one of them kills the other one and, and, and kind of runs away. We see it with, with Abraham's children, with Isaac and Ishmael and the different, different encounters they have as well. We see it even with Jacob and Esau, two twins who are struggling with each other in the womb already, not even born, but fighting each other to get out. Um, and then we see this uh, kind of cascading throughout the generations. Blood may be thicker than, than water, but actually, you haven't met my sister. You know, if you've met my sister, you'd understand just how difficult it is to get along with each other. Um, and so we tell ourselves this, this verse from the Psalms, how beautiful, how great it is when brothers and sisters sit nicely, play nicely together. I think less as a statement of fact, but more as an aspiration. Right? Is it, wouldn't it be wonderful if brothers and sisters could sit together? Wouldn't it be wonderful if families could, could actually get along with each other, that we don't have to move countries or divorce ourselves from our, our cousins or, or have family feuds that last for generations? Wouldn't it be wonderful if actually we could sit and we could play and we could get on well with each other? So I want to talk a little bit about some uh, Jewish concepts like on this same theme. I'm sure some of them will be familiar to you, some of them will, will chime, will resonate with things that have been said already, and I think that's a beautiful thing. But I also want to, us to bear in mind, okay, you know, we, we work together, we, we all can, can follow the slogan, the motto of the center, love for all, hatred for none. Um, but where is, the, where is the disjunct then? Why, why somehow do we, do we get this message wrong? I wanted to start with the Torah itself, the Hebrew Bible. Three verses from the different, three different books from the five books of Moses, um, which, ex which express the importance uh, of interfaith relations. You shall not hate your kinsfolk in your heart. Reprove your kinsman, but incur no guilt because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against your countrymen. Love your neighbor as yourself. This, this uh, last phrase, love your neighbor as yourself, love your fellow as yourself, v'havta re'echa kamocha, in Hebrew, is, you know, is considered to be the essence of the, of the Torah. There's a story in the Talmud. Oh, maybe we can try it. Would you, would you all mind standing up just for a second? So there's a story in the Talmud that a, a Roman, a, a non-Jew, came to Rabbi Shammai and he said, teach me the whole of the Torah standing on one foot. So can we, can we try standing on one foot? So we need to learn the whole of the Torah standing on one foot. And what did uh, this Rabbi Shammai do? He took his stick and he beat him. Now, don't be stupid. How can I teach you standing on one foot? Okay, swap feet. Um, standing on the other foot, uh, the same, say, same guy, the same Roman, went to Rabbi Hillel. And what did Rabbi Hillel say? the same question, teach me the Torah standing on one foot. And Rabbi Hillel said, do unto other people what you wish them to do to you. The rest is commentary, now go and study it. 
Okay, please be seated. <laughs> so this, you know, do unto others what others do to you. you know, do not do to your neighbor what is hateful to you. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is, I think, the golden rule of, of religion. You know, we've heard it expressed already this, this afternoon, and I'm sure we will hear it again. Um, do unto others how you wish them to, to, to treat you. This is really the golden rule of, of, of most religion. Um, a quick aside on, on what is all this business about being on one foot. Um, it's not just about you know, being well balanced and, and, and all this kind of thing. Um, it seems to be there's a linguistic pun in there that the Roman was using the word uh, regel, regulum, meaning rule. Give me, the, give me the whole of the Torah in one rule. But due to a mistranslation in Hebrew, the word for regel, uh, word regel means foot. So it seems to be there was a kind of misunderstanding in the giving of the question. Give me the Torah in one rule, or, or give me the Torah on one foot. Um, and this kind of led to this, this very memorable story of being on one foot, but it may have nothing to do with the, with the story at all, just, to, just to kind of where the Latin and the, the Aramaic or the Hebrew didn't quite fit together. That's from the book of Leviticus. But there's a second quote that goes further. You shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the feelings of the stranger, having yourself been strangers in the land of Egypt. And secondly, love the stranger. Go even further, not just don't oppress them, but love the stranger, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. And this, of course, is a reminder that all of us are strangers in one way or, an or another. None of us should feel so comfortable, so cozy in who we are, that we cannot accept people who are strange to us, who are different to us, who are foreign to us, and that we should not just you know, leave them alone, but that we should embrace other people beyond our families, beyond our religion, beyond our societies, because of our, of our, of our ancient story that we also, we were all strangers once ourselves, particularly Jews kind of in the land of Egypt that they escaped uh, in the book of Exodus as well. This love the stranger, of course, has taken different forms over the years. And I wanted to give you a couple of quotes by Martin Buber, 20th century uh, Jewish German philosopher. Our religion commands love and mercy both for the stranger and for the Jew, loving kindness and mercy for all of God's creatures. That is why we're commanded to love your neighbor as yourself. The love of others is higher than any other service that one can give to God. And this is based on a Hasidic, on a, on a kind of 18th, 17th, 18th century religious teaching. To love God truly, one must first love man. And if anyone tells you that he loves God and does not love his fellow man, you will know that he's lying. And I think this is an important challenge to, to somehow, sometimes what is traditional religiosity, um, a criticism. And I think Judaism likes and embraces criticism. Maybe we don't sleep so well at night, um, following what was, what, the, uh, what was said earlier, um, but that, we're able, that Judaism is, is based around challenging ourselves, self-criticism, challenging others um, with a sense to try and, as try, using the, the question to try and get to, uh, to, to truth. It's, it's maybe what, the Jewish way, one of, our, one of the many ways, one of the many different ways towards truth. Um, you know, there's a joke that if you ask, ask a ask a, Jew, a Jewish person a question, then they answer with a, with a question. Um, they don't give you an answer, they just answer with a question. And we can try this later if you want, it's quite a, <laughs> quite a good exercise. Is it? Mm, maybe. Um, but, yeah, it kind of works. But, but what is the point here? I mean, Martin Buber, he had, you know, had this big, big, big expression of an idea that we should try and relate to each other as an I and a thou. That we should see each other as a you, and not as an it, okay? That we, we should have a first, second person relationship, an I and a you, and not treat people as a third person that we're not really in, in dialogue with. So if you ask someone, how are you? And they reply, oh, terrible, oh, it's great, that's great. You haven't really, really heard them. And this relates to what I think what's also been said before about listening to the other person, that only through this first listening can you get to this um, first, second person relationship, this I and this you, and, and that actually true religion expresses itself 
through uh, your, your efforts, and, and, your, and it can be a challenging effort to relate to other people. And that God you know, comes through that relationship with, with other people. Of course, Sartre said that, that hell is other people, right? So this can be part of the challenge uh, as well. But ultimately, you, you know, to find God, you need to, to overcome that. First, you must love your other, other human beings. Um, and, if you, and if you ignore that part, you, know, you, you cannot get to, 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 to anything else. In Judaism, it's also important to uh, work with others regardless of their religion. It's a principle that everybody has a place in the world to come. Jews don't think that uh, it's just Jews that go to heaven and, and not other people. Every, every righteous person has a place in the world to come. And I give a quote from the Talmud which says, In a city when there are both Jews and non-Jews, the collectors of alms collect from both Jews and non-Jews. They feed the poor of both. They visit the sick of both, they bury both, and they restore the lost goods of both for the sake of peace. So this is, again, you know, an important thing that uh, sometimes communities can be seen as, as working just for themselves. Um, but actually, it's a Jewish principle that uh, when there are people in need, um, when we're living together, and of course, for, for the best part of 2,000 years, uh, Jews have been living as minority communities you know, across the world, in, in, across the what we call the diaspora, uh, the dispersal. Um, you know, we're looking to, to play a part um, with our neighbors as well. And yet we know that there are difficult texts in all of our religions. Sometimes we can select the texts which, which work for harmony, and sometimes there are texts which we can, we, which we can find which, which promote disharmony. Um, and this, this, uh, this last text on the page by Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, a Jewish rabbi, a legal scholar from the 20th century, he said, all must appreciate that a refusal to treat a non-Jew on the Sabbath would now be totally unacceptable in every country known to us. If it should be reported that a Jewish doctor refuses to treat a non-Jew on the Sabbath when he does treat his fellow Jews, true animosity will result to the detriment of the Jewish inhabitants. And what does this come in response to? Um, you know, the idea that there are, that there are texts, and, then, and there are texts which say, you know, that there are readings of texts which say, okay, maybe you shouldn't break certain rules. Um, you, maybe you can break them only to help your fellow Jews. Um, but the, the overriding opinion is that you can break even the Sabbath, uh, the holiest day when you're not supposed to work, in order to save a life. And not just a, a Jewish life, but uh, any, any human life that ultimately the, the Jewish religion is here to, to preserve life and that life is the, is the highest value. Um, but you know, we understand that, that people do, do take issue with the way that some of these things have been expressed. Um, but certainly in, in modern, modern Judaism, we have to be very clear um, for anyone misreading our texts uh, that, uh, that we treat uh, all life as sacred um, and to be, to be uh, extended as far as possible. This, this defensiveness, I guess this feels a little bit defensive, but I, I give it the next page as, a, as overcoming suspicions, which had been a, a long time thing. Um, again, a story from the Talmud about Jews in Roman times. The Roman government sent two officers to the sages of Israel to learn the Torah. They read it, they read it again, and then a third time. As they left, they said, we've studied all your Torah carefully and found it to be the truth with this exception. If a Jew's ox gores a Gentile's ox, there's no liability. But if a Gentile's ox gores a Jew's ox, whether the ox has a history of goring or not, then full compensation has to be paid. Yeah, we, have, we have to read it a little bit, take it, take it in. Um, this is a self-criticism, I think. Right? This, is, you know, this, is, this text is you know, 1,500 years old. Um, and I guess partly it's a, it's a humble brag. It's a, it's a way of saying, well, okay, the Romans it like our Torah, but even they were able to find a mistake in it. Why is it that they have to pay us damages when our, our ox, our bull goes into, the China, into their China shop, into our China shop, but we don't have to pay it for theirs? Um, and this, you know, the Talmud is very much a dialectic. It's a, it's a huge debate. And uh, this you know, is the beginning quote of a big debate as to whether um, you know, Jews have to pay for Gentiles, or whether this is actually a fair criticism or not. Um, but I think putting it into the, the text 
and putting it into the into the into the Talmud um, is a way of, of addressing it that we're not hiding uh, from this problem that there are sometimes you know confusions and difficulties and suspicions between religions and only by writing them down and actually discussing it are we able to again get to our truth and, and find out what is fair and what is not fair um, but we have to address some of the difficulties between religions or between uh, different groups in order to, to come to some uh, kind of resolution for them. When we talk about national harmony, there's a very important uh, principle, dina de malchuta dina. The law of the land is the law. The Talmud makes clear that the halakhic rule is, that the legal Jewish legal rule is, that the law of the country is binding and in certain cases is to be preferred to Jewish law. Now I always tell this to my, my, my ch ch child students because under Jewish law the boys can get married at the age of 13 and the girls can get married at 12. Uh, when they have their bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah they're assumed to be Jewish adults. And it's a wonderful thing uh, scaring prepubescent kids with the idea that you know under Jewish law you could be married within six months. You know, the girls hate it and the, the boys hate it as well. They're like, no, 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 I don't want to marry. And I offer to match them up, you know, one with the other. And they're like, no, 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 come on, this is terrible. Um, and then, of course, we tell them, well, that might be Jewish law. But here in Singapore and, and of course, in, in almost every country, um, you know, the, the law of getting, uh, the age of getting married is much higher. And, of course, Jewish law follows uh, the law of the land, um, even when it's in, uh, when, even when it's in uh, distinction to, to, to Jewish law. Um, and that's, that's true um, you know, pretty much throughout, throughout the different laws. Um, I'm, I would not perform a, a Jewish marriage, for example, unless it was uh, already um, constituted by the, by, the, by the national, by the Singaporean uh, marriage office as well. Um, we don't perform anything that's, that's, that's basically illegal by the, by the, by the law, law of the land. And I think that's been an important principle that's uh, that's you know, held the Jewish community in good stead in different places, um, that Jews under a foreign government should obey the laws of their rulers, um, that the law of the kingdom should apply equally to all the citizens. And then, of course, you know, the idea that you shouldn't jaywalk or drive over the speed limit, cheat on your taxes. Um, you, sh you can't really do any of this and still consider yourself a religious person. The ethical behavior is paramount and ethical behavior with relation to, to the national laws. They may not be your, the laws in your religion. Um, I'm not sure any, any religion says that you can uh, drive above the speed limit of the, of, of the land. Um, but you know, if, you, if you behave as if you're, you're not living in a society, that's not Jewish behavior, it's not good Jewish behavior. Ethical behavior is paramount. And of course, as well as, as harmonious relations, we, we all look for peaceful relations. The whole idea of the Torah, all that was written in the Torah was written for the sake of peace. Um, you know, religious teaching is there that we can get on with in our own societies and get on with the societies around us. That the, the Torah is a kind of manual for how to live your life. Um, it's a, it shows us the way of, of good living, the way of, of living our life well. And that's a peaceful way. And the prophets, Isaiah and Micah in, in the Bible, you know, the, these quotes as well, they should beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And again, this vision um, of, of, of a peaceful society, peace between countries, this is what we're, we're aiming for. Great is peace since all other blessings are included in it. The only reason that God created the world was so that there would be peace among humankind. And this is quite a, a statement as well. Uh, the only reason that God created the world was so that we would, could have peace. That's where I'm ending today. Um, thank you for uh, listening to me and uh, I'm very happy to be part of this, uh, this uh, these series of talks uh, with all the different religions. And again, thank you to our hosts for, for hosting it this afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Rabbi Nathan, for uh, that um, enlightening um, um, presentation, uh, followed with a 
a, 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 an example to stand up and uh, that will become very memorable. I almost fell off my uh, <laughs> foot. So um, thank you for that. I, I particularly enjoyed uh, your, your line about the honest openness discussions um, when it comes to certain suspicions. I think that's really valuable um, in today's world. And I think that that could go really far. And, and I really enjoyed the Leviticus example that you gave of love your fellow neighbor as yourself. Um, and uh, love the stranger. It really is an underlying thread for all of these uh, discussions we've had with everybody. I think the word love has been uh, pronounced by everybody today. So uh, thank you again. Um,